This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 14, for January 4th, 2009. That's right. Happy New Year. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm joined by Alan Dove. And I'm Alan Dove. Welcome back. Did you have a good New Year, Alan? Yeah, it was okay. You know, typical uh, typical parental New Year. Um, stayed home, um, put the kid to bed, had takeout sushi. Um, that was about it. Watched the ball drop on TV. Yeah, the ki- the young children years are different. When when your child is older, then you get back into the old stuff again. Right, right, because you can send them out drinking then. Yeah, that's right, and worry about them. <laughs> This is our first TWIV of 2009, and we hope to have a full year of TWIV this year. And uh, lots of guests. So if you like virology, subscribe, keep listening, tell your friends. Uh, Dick Dick Despommier will be back this week, so hopefully we will get back to a normal TWIV schedule during the week, which is probably most convenient for all of us. And we're going to try and do it on Fridays. But Dick is a tough guy. He's really popular and famous, so we have to work with him, Alan. Yeah, well, well, and and we'll have to uh, we'll have to you know put up with the additional paparazzi. I'm sure now that uh, vertical farming is hit the the really big time. You mean the Time Magazine? Yeah, the Time Magazine piece a while ago. I don't know. Maybe he won't talk to us anymore. That's right. We might have to call his people and uh, you know, see what we can work out. You know, maybe Twiv will just push him over the edge of fame, you know? That's right. (laughs) It's a weekly thing. So anyway, Twiv is um, moving up on iTunes. If you go to iTunes podcast directory, there's a category called medicine. And within that, there's another category called science and medicine. In, In science and medicine, we are number 73 out of 100. So that's not bad, but it's, it's quite dynamic because yesterday we were 48. Oh. So, and this is based mainly, I think, on subscribers, new subscribers, the rate of new subscribers. So uh, let's get up there. Help us, help push us into the top 10. Help us get high. Oh, I mean, yeah, no. Uh, one of our science podcasts of the week, previous ones, the Brain Science Podcast is often number one in that category. Let's try and get close to that podcast, everyone. I know there are lots of people listening, and uh, let's get some more and uh, push it up there. Tell your friends. Yeah. So today we have the usual great collection of stories, and we have some reader emails, so uh, let's get going here. Uh, The first is, let me tell you about a virus that I had. (laughs) You know, there's nothing like bringing reality to virology than having an infection yourself. And uh, earlier this year, I had a, a zoster infection, which we talked about on another TWIV. And this past week, I had a, a lovely upper respiratory tract viral infection. It was a viral infection. Now, you may say, how do you know it was a viral infection? Well, you never can be 100% sure. But I've had this so many times, and it's such a typical episode that I thought it would be worth going through, and it really is educational because it illustrates several important points about virology. So last Monday, the the 29th of December, I woke up and I felt a little scratchiness in my throat, and I said, ah, here we go. It's an acute rhinovirus infection. Yep. I'd had that many times. I knew the pattern. I knew the drill. It was going to progress to a sore throat, runny nose, Tuesday I had a sore throat, and at that point, it could be a bacterial infection as well. As many of you may know, you can get strep throat, and that gives you a really bad sore throat. On Wednesday, I had sneezing, runny nose, watery eyes, all the typical symptoms of a viral infection of the upper tract. And if you have strep throat, you typically don't have those kinds of symptoms. By Thursday, the symptoms got worse. I started to cough, but I could still feel the focus in my head, the nose, mouth, eyes, so forth, nothing below the neck, so to speak. So it was an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, Now, in contrast, other viruses can go into your lower tract, typically influenza, and uh, in that makes you have massive coughing and 
really feel much, much worse when the virus gets down. And of course, if it goes down into your lungs, then you get viral pneumonia, which is very serious. Right. I didn't have any of that, just upper tract. By Friday, I started to feel better, and uh, that's it. And so not really a serious infection. I went to the lab a few times. I was trying to write a review article, and I could barely see the monitor because my eyes were, <laughs> were tearing. I was constantly sneezing and coughing, which is not good because that's how you spread the infection to others, of course. So right. fortunately, last week, there weren't many people around, so I, I didn't infect too many others. Uh, but Friday, it was over. Now, what could I have done? Not much. Nothing. So Monday, when I felt this, I've had it so many times, I could have possibly taken an antiviral, right? But there aren't any. This is an acute infection. That is rapid onset of disease and a short and sometimes severe outcome. But I didn't know what virus it was. What are the possibilities? The most likely is rhinovirus, because we know that rhinoviruses cause over half of all respiratory tract infections. Right. So it was likely to be a rhinovirus. And you get typically one or two a year of rhinovirus infections. But it could also have been a paramyxovirus, a coronavirus, even an adenovirus. Respiratory syncytial virus, not likely. I probably had that when I was a kid and uh, not getting it again. So you would need to have a rapid diagnostic to know what virus it is because there are no broad spectrum antivirals. In fact, there aren't many at all. Right. Uh, and there certainly aren't any uh, that would have been useful to me. I would have had to gone to an office on Monday, had some kind of a rapid dipstick test and said, ah, this is rhinovirus 23. Here's a prescription for an antiviral. You go right to the drugstore. If I started taking that on Monday, maybe I would have... Uh, reduced my symptoms somewhat. Right. But we don't have rapid diagnosis, and consequently we don't have antivirals for these acute upper tract infections. So the only thing I could do was, you know, take Tylenol, drink a lot of water to make your uh, nasal secretions fluid and not, not thicker, uh, loosen up your throat so you don't have such a bad sore throat. And it, so if you feel bad, you can do things to help feel better, but the, the infection is going to run its course because there's nothing you can do. Yep. And very importantly, you don't go and pester your doctor for antibiotics. Uh, that's a good point. Many people do that. Yeah. And they get antibiotics. And in fact, it's not a, it's not a bacterial infection. You know, sometimes you get secondary bacterial infections after... Uh, these, these viral infections. You can tell that because your mucus and nasal secretions are, are yellow, but you don't really need to take antibiotics for that unless you have immune compromise and so forth. But Alan is right. Often individuals get a cold, they run to the physician, they get a prescription for an antibiotic, and um, it doesn't do any good. And all it does is increase resistance to these antibiotics in the population. Now, on the other hand, if your, systems, if your symptoms persist, you should certainly get that worked up and, and see what's wrong. But right. So if mine had persisted, absolutely, something's yeah. up. But I knew it would be over within a week because I've had it before. I know the course of the infection. I'm not telling everyone to diagnose their own infections. We're using this, as, <laughs> no. a, we're yeah. using this right. as an educational tool to illustrate acute infections, the lack of antivirals, and uh, why that is the case. And, and it certainly does not hurt to go to your doctor and, and see what the problem is. Just, uh, just don't harangue them to give you a particular treatment. Right. Now, the point of uh, antibiotics is a good one because, Alan, you may have seen this past week. Uh, the Wall Street Journal ran a post about uh, big big box stores giving away uh, free anti generic antibiotics. Yes. And so if you went to your physician and got a prescription for penicillin or whatever generic version of your antibiotic, you could get it free at Walmart, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, or Giant. It's not a great idea to give it away, I suppose, because I think that encourages people to use it indiscriminately. Well, but I um, I saw when you, you posted that link and I was looking at it and uh, I was at least heartened that they do require a prescription. Um, I mean, the situation that you have in, uh, in some other countries actually is because of the shortage of physicians, you can actually walk into a pharmacy and just get an antibiotic without a prescription. Um, and that 
is obviously disastrous because then anybody who gets a little cough goes in and gets an antibiotic and takes three doses of it, you know, and, and makes all of their intestinal flora antibiotic resistant. And <laughs> right, exactly. And yeah. then we get serious problems. Yeah, so we don't want to encourage indiscriminate use of antibiotics. Uh, but the point that you need a prescription is a good one. An appropriate use of them is fine. Of course. Uh, the, we should point out the way we were alerted to this is uh, we, Alan and I uh, are active on Twitter, and yes. uh, we, subs we follow individuals who post information about science-related topics for the most part. I find that to be the most useful aspect of Twitter. There are a number of individuals who post science articles when they see them, and we've started to do, this, to do the same ourselves. So you can be working, and if you have a Twitter window open, you'll see an article. In this one, we saw a Wall Street Journal. Uh, they said that big box stores are giving away generic antibiotics, and it starts a discussion because then you, I posted a comment saying this is not a good idea, and a friend of mine uh, wrote a response on the Wall Street Journal blog, and Alan then added, well, it is prescription uh, required, so it's not so bad. So it's a very interesting use of Twitter, I think, and I think it will evolve more so that people will have very focused interests and you can get really rapid information from this service. Yeah, I think um, it's like a lot of Web 2.0 tools. The best way to approach it is to disregard what the, uh, what the creators say it's supposed to be used for and come up with your own use. Um, you know, the whole idea of Twitter, they say you're supposed to post what you're doing, when, when in fact that's about the least useful information anybody could put up, you know, and you, and you get people who are putting up, oh, I'm driving to work or, you know, I'm about to go to bed or what have you. And, um, you know, frankly, nobody cares, yeah. but it's, uh, it's very useful if you post, um, you know, something more relevant, like what are you thinking about? Um, what what interesting information have you come across that uh, people who are following your Twitter feed might actually be interested in, and that you can you can put in 140 characters or less? Right. So I often res while I'm researching uh, posts for Twiv or my virology blog, if I find something interesting, I'll, I'll throw it up on Twitter with a link. And then people can find that. And I find people following me as a result of these little posts, which is interesting. So, And then I, I look at the people who are following me. I look at who they are following. And I right. can pick up interesting people to follow as well. Really, you're right. You don't need to tell people what you're doing. But the if you find information that you want to share, then it can be very useful. Right. Uh, let me, let's wrap up this, this virus infection part by saying my symptoms, runny, stuffy nose, watery eyes, sore throat, etc., those were all probably caused by my innate immune response to infection. So as soon as the virus is detected by the innate system, cytokines and chemokines are produced that have all these effects on you. The virus itself is not, it's not really causing a lot of cell damage in the respiratory tract. This has been shown for rhinovirus, at least. And all the symptoms are immune-mediated. So they're important because they help clear the infection. But uh, one approach that's been debated for these upper tract infections is actually to inhibit the immune response. So in other words, if you knew what cytokines, chemokines caused all these symptoms, you could possibly inhibit them. Now that's a double-edged sword, of course, because you don't right. want to uh, you don't want to encourage the virus to grow. But you know, with enough research, we may be able to target the symptoms rather than the virus itself. Because with these very rapid acute infections, again, by the time you're diagnosed and you have your antiviral in hand, it may be too late to do anything. But if you target the symptoms, then you might have a shot. Now that's in contrast to influenza, where the virus decimates decimates your respiratory epithelium, and it actually takes weeks for you to recover, and you feel yeah. lousy for a while after flu. That's why you should get the vaccine, because it's really a crappy infection, and, it, and you can be out for two weeks, really, with that. Right. And you can still, you can certainly still get the virus um, if you've been vaccinated, but your, your odds of, uh, of being out for weeks are decreased. You may, you may get a much milder form of it. Yeah, and of course, if there's a new strain... Sure pandemic strain, no vaccine will help you, at least in initially. But we don't have that yet. Nope. And speaking of influenza, our next story I came across in PLOS Pathogens. And it's an interesting article, just came out last week, which is called Transmission of Influenza Virus in a Mammalian Host is Increased by PB2 Amino Acids 627K or 627E-701N. I wouldn't have made this title, guys, but 
No. Right. <laughs> I would rather have a more descriptive title, but this is factual, so we're going to explain it to you. But this is an interesting article on the potential for transmission of the H5N1 uh, influenza virus uh, strains. So as everyone probably knows, these H5N1 viruses, the, the avian viruses, have caused a lot of uh, human infections. In fact, the, the article says there have been 380 reported cases of severe disease uh, since 2003 caused by the H5N1 viruses, and half, more than half have been fatal, which is quite high in terms of influenza. Right. But these viruses don't transmit from person to person. Mostly these people who have been infected have a lot of contact with, uh, with birds or uh, of various kinds. And uh, human-to-human transmission, which would make this a pandemic strain, hasn't occurred yet. So the question is, what do these viruses need to be transmitted? And in particular, why are the human strains transmitted well uh, and not the avian strains. So in this paper, they use a guinea pig model of uh, influenza transmission. And this is a very nice model because the guinea pig is uh, reasonably uh, manipulable. They're not too expensive as, say, a monkey would be. Right. And you put the, the, the guinea pigs, you can do two kinds of infections. You can put them in adjacent cages and such that airflow would bring virus from one cage to the next, or you could put them in the same cage, in which case you, you need direct contact or close contact for uh, transmission. And then you, you have some guinea pigs who are infected and uninfected, and you measure the transmission of the virus. So here, uh, what they've, they've looked at two uh, amino acid locations in, in a protein of the virus called PB2. And this is one of the four viral proteins that comprises the RNA polymerase complex, basically. Uh, of the of the virus, and these are two amino acids, six two seven or seven o one. And the reason they looked at these uh, is because six two seven in human protein in human viruses like H three N two viruses or H one N one is almost exclusively a lysine. But in the bird viruses, the avian isolates, it's a glutamic acid. And there has been some previous work which suggests that. Uh, this is important for host range of the virus. So in this paper, they put this change from lysine, human, to glutamic acid, bird, into two different viruses, an H3N2 human virus and an H5N1 uh, avian virus, and they ask what's the effect uh, in guinea pig transmission. And they did the same thing basically for uh, the, the 701 amino acid, and then they look uh, at the transmission. And basically what they find is that when you change from lysine to glutamic acid, say at 627, you decrease the transmission of the virus, right? So you, the, again, the lysine is the human amino acid. Those viruses are transmitted well among the guinea pigs. You change it to, to glutamic acid, which is the avian sequence, and you don't transmit well. So this confirms that uh, 627 is a, an important determinant of transmission, and it also confirms that uh, lysine, which is in the human strains, works well in this model, and glutamic acid in the in the bird strains doesn't. So we know the bird strains don't transmit well, and it may be in part because of this amino acid. Now, of course, these are guinea pigs, and so we have to have caveats. We're not sure if the exact same issues apply to humans, but it's suggestive. But the, the suggestion is very interesting that these two amino acids do regulate transmission in, in a, some way, and uh, the current avian strains may not transmit well because they don't have the right amino acid at this position. Right. Essentially, what, uh, what the researchers are doing in this case is figuring out what the virus needs to do to uh, to achieve human to human transmission and the more we know about that the more we can do to uh, hopefully head it off yeah so if you start to see uh, avian isolates with this um, lysine at this position you would worry right 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 that's when you would you would gear up and uh, look more closely I mean you could take those viruses and immediately test them in this guinea pig model and then you have to make a decision whether you're going to uh, make a vaccine against that or not. Right. But um, it's interesting that the avian strains have not uh, incorporated this lysine at uh, 627, say, or, or the corresponding amino acid at 701, despite uh, infecting yeah. humans for many years. Yeah, it may be. They just, um, you know, either that has that has some slight negative selection attached to it or uh, 
you know, or there's some other reason that the, the virus just hasn't hit on that. Yeah. I think this is quite interesting, and it illustrates what you can do uh, in the laboratory with these uh, viruses. And one of the issues about why the avian strains are not uh, transmitted well. Right. Uh, I don't think this is the whole story, and the authors don't imply that, but this is certainly part of it. And it's really interesting. So we'll post a link to this uh, in our show notes, and you can have a look at that. Uh, there's a lot more to the paper, of course, than we've discussed here. But if you're listening while you're pipetting in the lab, uh, this is probably enough to give you the gist of it. And you can go take a look later if you like or not. Whatever yep. be the case, TWIV can be your source of uh, learning new science. Uh, the next story has been around for about a week. And probably you saw this, Alan, the death of yeah. Christine Majora. Do you know anything about this, Alan? Yeah, I followed this story. I mean, as a as a science journalist, of course, this comes up. Um, anti science positions of of all kinds come across my radar repeatedly, and uh, you know, this is uh, Christine Majori um, was a very very prominent um, believer in the uh, the idea that HIV does not in fact cause AIDS, and the the real proponent of this um, was Peter Duesberg. Um, virologist who uh, who had done some good work uh, for a number of years and then decided that he was going to be a, uh, a so-called AIDS skeptic or an HIV skeptic. Um, and Duisberg went around claiming that AIDS was caused by other things, was not in fact related to HIV, and HIV was a harmless virus. Um, and uh, Christine Majore, um was HIV positive. She had contracted the virus, um, but she decided to believe that it would not cause immune deficiency. So she lived her life as if this was not a problem. Um, and uh, she had um, she had a couple of kids. Um, one of them, well, when she was pregnant, well, neither one. She didn't take antiretrovirals at any point, as far as we know. She denied that they were useful. Um, when she was pregnant with uh, her daughter, I guess um, she, you know, went ahead with the pregnancy and didn't breast and and didn't uh, take any any of the advice about breastfeeding. So she breastfed the daughter, which increases the risk of transmitting the virus. She did not take antiretrovirals while she was pregnant, and in fact, her daughter, you know, got the virus. Um, not surprisingly at all to those of us who understand the biology of this disease. And at the age of three, her daughter died of uh, of AIDS. Um, miraculously, her son, I guess, uh, who got the same treatment, he, she took no antiretrovirals when she was pregnant with him, and I believe she probably breastfed him. Um, he managed not to contract HIV, so he's he's still alive. He's okay. Um, but Christine Majori just, just died. Um, she was 52 years old, died of pneumonia, and uh, of course the family has not had an autopsy done because they probably wouldn't like to find out that this was, I'm certain, an AIDS-related death. Um, so here we have somebody who who bought into a, um, an, an anti-scientific belief system and it cost her her life and it cost uh, the life of her, of her, one of her children. Mm. It's just sad on so many levels. Yeah, this has gotten a lot of press and so we don't need to review everything, but Peter Duesberg you know, he was a skeptic initially, and it's great to be a skeptic in science. Absolutely, he absolutely. Was a, he was a skeptic far beyond the point when he needed to be because there was ample evidence that this virus, HIV-1, was causing AIDS. Um, and so I, I, don't, I think his skepticism was, after a certain point, misplaced, and he influenced people like Majore, and it's fatal in the end, and that's unfortunate. And he influenced the... Um... The Ministry of Health of South Africa, which was even more unfortunate. Yes, exactly. And uh, it's not, I don't understand. It's not as though Duesberg is not smart. He is a smart man. So I'm not sure what he was trying to do at one point. Well, I think these these types of beliefs, this um, what I think of as malignant skepticism, you know, it's, it's, as you say, it's great to be a skeptic initially. Somebody comes out with a new report. My, my knee jerk reaction is, well, how do you know that? Um, but, uh, but when the evidence has become overwhelming, you, you get to a point where you just, you have to go and bend the laws of reality in order to, to say that this is not the case. And at that point you have to say, well, okay, you know, science has proven the point here. Um, and, and scientists are very reluctant 
to reach that point. So if you have this this massive consensus on an issue, it's pretty fair to say that that's the case. Um, but I think what causes this is that the the skeptics of the position who hang on are are getting something out of that skepticism psychologically. And I think in Duisburg's case, it well, it made him an international celebrity. Um, you know, here was somebody who was a certainly a prominent virologist, but not a big name in the news until he, you know, promulgated this this uh, anti-establishment belief system, and he got a whole community of of followers. Um, and I think there was a certain amount of gratification in that. And in Christine Majori's case, I mean, come on, if somebody's HIV positive, it's it would be wonderful to believe that this is not going to kill you, that this is this is something you can ignore. Um, we're we're all denialists at some level. So I, I think people get something out of a belief system like that. That's a it's a psychological thing that's not based on rationality. And, and so you're not going to be able to reason them out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. One of the issues in science, of course, is you can never be or almost never be 100 percent sure of anything. You can have massive right. evidence in favor of something, but there will always be exceptions. Right. Newton was wrong. And, and here, the fact that her son uh, did not contract AIDS is an example of that. No virus is or almost no virus is 100 percent effective. And some people it just doesn't take for whatever reason. Yeah, and she lived. Um, she lived quite a while. For she lived uh, what fifteen years or so after after her initial coming up positive with HIV. So she was uh, a long survivor. She was an outlier on the curve. Yeah, and of course, if you take antiretrovirus, you can live a long time now, many many years, because you have wonderful combinations that make this a chronic disease. And it's really unfortunate. And we hope that other people aren't influenced by this. I mean, you, already the denialists are saying, well, she just had pneumonia and it wasn't had nothing to do with AIDS, and that debate will go on forever because they're not having an autopsy. But that the point is that this is, uh, you don't need to die from this disease any longer. And if people right. do, it's really, really unfortunate because the technology is there to prevent death. Yeah, I, I think if you're spending more time denying evidence than looking for it, um, then you've you've probably left the, the path of intelligent skepticism. Someone should uh, interview Duesberg and see what he thinks about this. Uh, let's close with a quote from the L.A. Times. Um, they ran a little opinion piece on this uh, I think it was January 3rd. It is admittedly difficult to spot the moment when a scientific theory becomes an accepted fact. It took hundreds of years for the Catholic Church to acknowledge the work of Galileo, and it still flinches at Darwin. So they were talking about when it became quite clear that uh, HIV was the etiologic agent of AIDS, and uh, you know the scientists will accept it quite quite soon before the public does, but eventually the public does as well, and it, it's sometimes hard to spot when that happens. Well, and I think um, actually even that quote from the LA Times, uh, they say the Catholic Church still flinches at Darwin. I think a few years ago, even the Catholic Church came around on Darwin. <laughs> but many people haven't, as you know. Oh, yeah. I read an excellent piece in Wired some time ago about this whole problem with evolution, and that he's the piece the point of the piece was basically that uh, we still call it a theory, and we shouldn't, because there's so <laughs> right. much evidence. It should be a law. <laughs> he said scientists should take uh, hints from other fields where they call things laws much more quickly. <laughs> and right. so let's make it the law of evolution, and then maybe people will. Because, you know, they put stickers on textbooks saying uh, evolution is a theory. Yeah, and sadly. Think, you know, textbooks that kids are going to use in it. It is it is the central organizing theory of all of biology. I mean, it's uh, like Newton's theories of motion. Yeah, just go to Madagascar; you can see it in action. Okay, uh, the, our our last story is uh, an update on the Ebola outbreak, which is really uh, going strong in the uh, DRC Congo Democratic Republic of of the Congo. And you can take a look on ProMed Mail. Uh, for some interesting articles on this. I, I found one the other day, and I'm quoting, the Ministry of Health of DRC is continuing to respond to the ongoing outbreak of Ebola in the Mueka Health Zone, province of Kasai, um, with the support of a wide range of international partners. As of the 31st of December, there's been a total of three laboratory-confirmed cases, and they think there are 36 additional suspected cases, including 12 deaths, and there are 184 people who have 
contacted infected individuals and they're being followed up. And ProMed Mail notes that only three of these are laboratory confirmed so far, although it's likely that the others are going to be as well. Now, right. today there was an update on ProMed Mail, which said uh, two Zimbabwean soldiers have been killed by the infection, the same outbreak that we're talking about. And these are soldiers who have been deployed uh, to reinforce Joseph Kabila's defense against the uh. rebel leader, leader Nukunda. And so they're getting infected in the course of, uh, of this military effort. And uh, the military, of course, is not saying anything about it, but uh, they're presumably coming in contact with uh, infected individuals. And so we should talk a, just a little bit about this uh, virus and this infection. Uh, this is, Ebola, of course, is a member of the phyloviridae, which is a family of negative strand RNA viruses uh, with a, a membrane envelope around them. The other member of this family is uh, Marburg virus, and they're both hemorrhagic fever viruses. And where you get infection with these viruses is a bit enigmatic still. Uh, it tends to happen largely in areas where there are primates, but it doesn't seem that the primates are the uh, reservoir. And I think more evidence recently is coming to uh, suggest that fruit bats might be the reservoir of these viruses. And fruit bats don't seem to be ill, uh, and they have virus in them. So these uh, bats, uh, these bats presumably at some point come in contact with humans, and that transmits the infection. And we know now that the the, the uh, great apes in Africa are being decimated by Ebola infection, and it could be transmitted to them by bats or by the fruit that's contaminated from the bat. And then at some point, humans contact either the bat, the contaminated food or the primates or primate meat and they get infection and because you have a lot of secretion uh, in a human infection you have vomiting you have bleeding often that is e it's easy to transmit it to uh, to other humans this is a very prominent disease because it has high lethality it doesn't transmit terribly well among humans if it did we'd have more of a problem right uh, than we do so far or it would have evolved to be less less pathogenic. It might have evolved, yeah. I mean, I think if it goes more and more in people than it has, it would eventually do that, although maybe not. Sometimes you can imagine that uh, high pathogenicity could be positively selected for if it helps transmission in some ways. Right. Yellow fever virus, for example. Yeah, so it could go either way. But this... Uh, is quite a spectacular infection. So again, it's a hemorrhagic fever. You have typical viral initial symptoms, high fever, headache, muscle joint pain, etc. But then it progresses, it infects many organs, and you get diarrhea, you get bleeding, uh, hemorrhagic fever, vomiting, etc. And then, of course, when you're vomiting and have diarrhea, that's uh, increasing the chance that you're going to infect other individuals. So this is a, a new strain, as we've talked before about, uh, that's causing this outbreak. And uh, maybe there are going to be a few hundred cases. We'll see. Yeah. How would you restrict this? This is a good question. What are they doing in DRC uh, to restrict it? Well, I don't, I don't have a lot of information on this. Do you? Based on past outbreaks and the and the analyses that have followed, the reason one of the reasons that you see these outbreaks occur, I mean, besides the virus is probably probably endemic in some species in that area, um, but you you see these things occur as outbreaks there because um, medical care and things like what we call universal precautions, putting on latex gloves and and barrier protection when when the doctors are dealing with a patient, um, those those things are very hard to come by um, in a lot of parts of Africa and certainly uh, Democratic Republic of Congo is one of those places, um, and uh, you know, that's a big part of the problem is that the people are getting sick with this virus. It is somewhat contagious. It's not. Um, as you say, it's not highly contagious. You don't get everybody in the community catching it. Um, but if someone has come down with it and nobody's wearing gloves while they're working with this patient and they're uh, in close contact with them, then you get the medical staff catching it and then they spread it to other people. And so you, you get these clusters, these outbreaks, um, and they seem to they seem to kill dozens or sometimes even hundreds of people, but then they burn themselves out. 
so the way to contain it is really to put in place, I think, the kind of contain, containment procedures that would be in place in a, in a developed country where you would you would take greater precautions, you would isolate the cases and, and try to um, keep them from, from having contact with people who aren't gloved and gowned. Exactly. And I think also the other problem is that these happen in small villages in Africa where it's much easier to be transmitted. Logistics and logistics is a nightmare. So, you know, you have people living in rather crude housing and then you often have people coming in and out and looking at and seeing or visiting a sick person and that transmits the infection, unfortunately. So there's no isolation at all. Well, the this is a spectacular infection and as many of you may know, it has spawned a lot of popular cultural items, right? So there was Tom Clancy novels about this virus, um, The Hot Zone, a book by Richard Preston, and there's a video game called Resident Evil, which is sort of loosely based on uh, this virus. So uh, you have a really lethal virus that's spectacular in nature. It's immediately taken up by writers and and all kinds of of, uh, media people. So Very much out of proportion to its actual medical impact. Yes, absolutely. I I think of it as the Paris Hilton of viruses. You know, it's famous for being famous. Uh, We have a couple of interesting reader emails this week, so let's go through those. Um, Everett is back, and he writes, On your last episode, there was talk of influenza. However, to become truly a threat to humans in terms of transmissibility and pathogenicity, doesn't it need to go through a porcine vector first to be better acclimated to our pulmonary physiology. It seems this was one of the factors in 1917 with Camp Funston. They don't have to pass through pigs to become better acclimated, but what we think is that pigs are actually a mixing vessel for avian and human strains. So the pig seems to be really susceptible to both human uh, and avian strains. So they're often co-infected, and then you get reassortment and production of new viruses, and some of which then may be better able to grow in humans so that you don't really get it's sort of you could look at it as a neutral mixing vessel the pig and uh, it doesn't add anything as far as we know uh, to the virus and there's some I mean there's a lot of areas of the world where infections of pigs humans and birds all happen at the same time so this can happen and in fact in Italy a study was done some years ago which showed evidence for reassortment in pigs of uh, human and, and uh, avian strains and this was by sequence analysis so the, these studies showed that from 85 to 89 pigs contained reassortants derived from an avian H1N1 strain and a human H3N2 strain so it's it's a mixing vessel and I, I think that's also why um, China is the the center of so many of the new strains, and that's why people see the new strains most often coming out of Asia, um, because just statistically, it is the place in the world that has the most settings where you have large combinations of pigs and ducks in particular right next to each other on a farm with people, and so you have that kind of setup is very typical of agricultural and of, of agricultural. Um, settings in Asia, uh, whereas in other countries you would have the poultry farm someplace else from where the pigs would be. So there you go, uh, Everett. I'd never heard of Camp Funston. Had you, uh, Alan? I I had, but I had to Google it to remember why I had heard of it. Um, I believe one of my relatives was there for training for uh, World War I. Yeah, so it was a camp uh, in the U.S., in Kansas, and it actually ha- had the first recorded cases of uh, Spanish flu yep. in 1918, uh, March of 1918. So uh, Everett said also, he wrote, Dr. Rasmus's comment in terms of calling this pandemic Spanish flu is a bit of a misnomer. The royal family of Spain took ill, and at that time they were the only ones not censoring their media. So he's right, the... It, the Allies uh, in World War One called it Spanish flu mainly because most of the news about it was coming out of Spain, and Spain wasn't censoring their information because they weren't involved in the war. So they called it Spanish flu when, in fact, it was everywhere, of course. But the right. name stuck, and it didn't originate in Spain. But it's one of these misnomers that just is propagated. So it's called Spanish flu to this day. It is a bit of a misnomer, but uh, it's sort of like transfection, which is used to describe the introduction of any nucleic acid into cells. And it's not correct because it's only the introduction of an infectious genome into cells, but it's used by everyone 
right. and you can't change it. So we won't change Spanish flu. So Everett, everybody says Spanish flu. Connor writes, I'm sending this message to let you know how thankful I am of your podcast. The podcast thing is new to me. I've found a lot of stuff to listen to, but only a small amount of it has been worth my time, and your show is certainly on a list I have continued to use. Although I only started listening recently, I've had the opportunity to listen to all of the shows and do some of the accompanying reading suggestions. Previously, I was going to a university and working towards my bachelor's in microbiology. My health pulled me away from the program, but I am now beginning to take some classes again. Your show has been refreshing. So thank you for all the time, and I hope to continue listening. Well, thanks for that great comment. I'm, we're always glad when people uh, find good use of the podcast, and uh, we hope you keep listening. We tr do try to make it educational. Then MC from China wrote, I'm a college student from China. I want to ask questions about virus. Does the high symmetry of virus structure have effect on the virus itself or on infection? If there has, what is the influence? Outstanding question. And a tough one to answer in a, in a yeah. podcast, but um, here are some thoughts. <clears throat> this is why we need video, Vince. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to do some video this year, and uh, it's a matter of time because um, it takes a bit more time than audio. We'll try and do that. But for structure, yeah, video would be perfect, of course. Well, there are two kinds of symmetry in, in viruses. One is called icosahedral, and one is called helical. And the helical symmetry typically refers to the way the genome is wrapped with a protein. Uh, and many animal, plant, bacterial viruses have genomes that are wrapped with helical symmetry. And uh, tobacco mosaic virus, for example, you have a single protein that interacts with the RNA and, and with each other, with other proteins, in the same way to form a helical structure, and that's why it has symmetry. Now, one consequence of that symmetry is that any volume can be enclosed by varying the length of the helix. So you can have very long genomes or very short ones accommodated by these. Now, typically, these tend to be enveloped. Uh, for some of the plant viruses, the, the helical genomes are naked, but for animal viruses that have helical symmetry, influenza viruses, paramyxoviruses, rhabdoviruses, they're all enveloped. And that, of course, will influence the stability of the virus, the way it's transmitted. These tend to be not very stable. They don't survive long periods on surfaces, so they have to be transmitted by respiratory routes or direct contact or even by mosquito bites or needle needle injections, for example. So in that sense, the structure influences its stability uh, and transmission. It also, of course, influences how the virus replicates. These viruses have to fuse to the cell to get in, and they have to bud to get out of the cell. So there are many consequences of, of how, having that kind of symmetry. It's important to point out, you know, the membrane vir viruses are less stable just lying on a surface in the environment, but that does not mean that they're necessarily less contagious. Uh, measles virus comes to mind. Yes, absolutely. But but yes, the, the helical helical caps that allows you to in, to enclose any length of genome, you just make it a little bit longer and you can in, and you can carry a longer genome with you. And if you Google the web, you find wonderful pictures of uh, these various viruses. Now, icosahedral symmetry, the structural proteins are arranged with the symmetry of, an, of this polyhedron, the icosahedron. It's the, and it turns out to be the best way to use just a few proteins or even one protein to make a shell that's very stable, an icosahedron. In the simplest form, a trimer of one protein, cor which will correspond to each triangular face of the icosahedron. And since the icosahedron has 20 faces, then you need just 60 subunits to make a capsid. Very simple. So there are some viruses with just one protein repeated 60 times. You make this enclosed shell, and they're very stable. Now, because they're closed shells, the amount of nucleic acid that you can put in it is limited. It's limited by the volume inside. So you can't change the amount of uh, nucleic acid, say, in a poliovirion without dramatically altering the capsid. Right. Also, these are, tend to be more stable, so they can survive on surfaces. They can often go through the intestinal tract, which is extremely hostile. So, for example, polio is very stable on surfaces, and it can infect you uh, through the tract where you have all kinds of extremes of pH and enzymes and so forth. Noroviruses are another example. So that's a consequence of this very stable capsid structure. There are some viruses with icosahedral capsids which also have an envelope, and these are not necessarily more stable because they do have this envelope, which inherently is less stable than the, than the protein shell. And yellow fever virus comes to mind. 
It has an icosahedral capsid or nucleocapsid, but outside is a membrane. And this, of course, has to be transmitted by a mosquito vector because it's less stable. Now, this symmetry, of course, has been exploited recently to make batteries, very small batteries, which we talked about on TWIV number eight. Yeah, very cool work. And that is absolutely fascinating. You should go have a listen to TWIV 8 and all the references there to these uh, these small batteries. And this is going to be used for many, many things. You can use both helical or icosahedral symmetry of viruses to assemble such nanoparticles. Good question, though. Very nice. Yes. Send, send in some more. It's fun. I wanted to mention a neat application for the iPhone iPod Touch, which I came across. One of my sons received an iPod Touch for uh, Christmas. I was looking at the App Store, so on these devices you can download little applications. Some of them are free. And there's one called Molecules. It's written by Sunset Lake Software. And basically it's a viewer of PDB files. PDB stands for Protein Data Bank, which is the, f the format for structural data that can be used to construct three-dimensional representations of uh, proteins. So you can download any PDB file onto your iPhone, iPhone or Touch and display the molecule. And you can rotate it with your finger in all directions. You can make it bigger or smaller so you can zoom in. And this is fabulous. That's awesome. You can just be sitting. You can be driving if you're stuck in traffic. No, I don't think that's a good application. Let's say you're on the subway. No. <laughs> you could look at your molecule, your favorite molecule. I, I, this is just great. It's free. It's beautiful. And the interface, of course, is gorgeous. You get a very nice picture. It sure beats that Iris workstation we had to use when I was in graduate school. Yes. Yeah, so what Alan's referring to is we had a computer that we used to display these uh, these files back in the 80s, early 90s. And 90s. Yeah. Into the 90s, I was there. And this was a thirty or $40,000 computer, which, which ran on a Unix-based software, which was difficult and you could display these things and rotate them and do exactly everything that we've just mentioned. And now you can do it on a $300 thing that you can hold in the palm of your hand. Which is also Unix-based. It is Unix-based, absolutely. But you don't even have to look at the Unix. That's right. You, don't, you don't, need to, don't need to interact with the command line to do this. It's really, really awesome. Have you seen these apps at all, Alan? I, I have. I've looked at, um, at these little gadgets, um, but I have not acquired one. I was really, really tempted to get the iPod Touch, but it was just, you know, I couldn't quite come up with a justification for it. Although, hey, now... Molecules. And you know, there's a virus game, which we talked about some time right. ago. Uh, now, I ha that reminds me, I have to download that uh, that virus game and, and try it, and next time I'll, I'll tell everyone what it's like. But uh, we'll talk about... If we find science-related apps for this uh, platform, we'll talk about them. I think it's fascinating because it makes this not just a toy, not just for entertainment, but you can learn something from right. it. I showed this, This I found this on New Year's Eve, and we had some people here, and everyone was totally fascinated. Non-scientists alike were fascinated by this, this ability to look at molecules in this way. So it really brings science to more people, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we want to do. Now it's time for our picks of the week. The first one is our science blog. And this is a neat one called Viroblogi, or Viroblogi. It's a combination of virus, virology, and blog. And it's uh, by a professor at the University of Cape Town. And he does this for his students in his course, but I like it. It's got a nice series of posts about viruses, and they're pretty up to date. He was talking about uh, the Lassa, the new Lassa strain recently, for example. So check it out. We'll put the link in the show notes. Viral blocky. And our science podcast of the week is Astronomy Cast. Ever seen that one, uh, Alan? I I actually subscribed to that very briefly. Um, I listened to a few episodes, but uh, I just I don't get out to look at the stars often enough. You are sure. No, I, I've always loved astronomy, and I got to tell you, this is inspired. Last night I went outside, and I saw Orion in the sky, and it was the most perfect view of Orion I have ever seen. I mean, you could see the, the stars on the belt, the arms in the, in the club or whatever it is he's got in his hand. And so I said, I got to listen to a, an astronomy podcast, and I found this one. It's two people talking about stars, planets, black holes, everything astronomy in a really accessible way. I think it's great. And I, I mean, I'm fascinated by astronomy. You, you look up there, you see all these stars and planets, and you don't know anything about them. So try it out. And the last uh, pick is our science book of the week. 
which is a book called The Cutter Incident by Paul Offit. And this is a very interesting uh, recounting of a, of a very sad sequence of events that occurred in 1955 uh, when the first polio vaccine was released. This was the killed vaccine developed by Jonas Salk. And unfortunately, a batch was released by a company in California, which wasn't completely inactivated. This is a virus vaccine that's killed using formalin. And one of the batches wasn't completely inactivated, and 200,000 people got it. 70,000 became ill, and 200 were paralyzed. 10 died, in fact. The author goes over this outbreak, its causes, its consequences. I mean, one of the big ones is just totally destroying confidence in vaccines. I mean, this is a time when parents were clamoring for something because their kids were getting polio. I mean, this is a big time in medicine in the U.S., and here they get it, and then it makes their kids sick. Yeah. And in fact, the subtitle of the book is How America's First Polio Vaccine Led to the Growing Vaccine Crisis. And I don't know if that was the beginning, because now it really is. There's a lot of resistance to immunization, but it was certainly a really sad story in American medicine. So why did it happen? Read this book. Yeah, and I think I think the um, I mean that kind of gets back to what we were saying before about uh, people who remain skeptical of something long after it's been proven. Uh, this this incident is a station of the cross for people who are anti-vaccine. Absolutely, it's too bad, right? It shouldn't it, be. It really is. I mean, it was it was one it was one screw up. It was one processing screw up by a laboratory, which was certainly had enormous um, enormous implications, but. Uh, you know, it also created um, a, an additional effort to uh, to more carefully regulate these processes and more carefully test vaccine batches. So, you know, kind of kind of the way food scares have actually made us made our food supply safer. Um, this has uh, made vaccines safer in a in an unfortunate way. But well, you know, in the beginning, when something is new, you quickly learn what mistakes not to make. Right. And in the case of a vaccine, unfortunately. It's at the expense of people, and, and it's terrible to happen this way. But as since then, there have been no batches made that have been defective. Right. So you do learn, but I, I'm, I know it's really bad to learn in this way. But I think we get better at it. But I do think this is something everyone should read because uh, it really was the beginning of this lack of confidence, and uh, it, you should find out why. So yeah. it's a really good book. It's well, Paul Offit is a very good writer. He's a professor also, but he writes very well and is well researched. And uh, have a look at it. We have a link at the Twiv bookstore on Amazon for that. Uh, remember, we're giving away some copies of Principles of Virology. Check out the rules for the contest on twiv.tv. Basically, if you link to us from your blog or website, uh, you have a chance to win one of four copies. I've just started a social network for bioscientists called biocrowd.com. If you're interested in interacting with other scientists or looking for jobs, check it out. Uh, I, I can be followed on uh, Twitter. My handle is P-R-O-F-V-R-R, Prof V-R-R. And yours, Alan? Uh, mine is my name, Alan Dove, A-L-A-N-D-O-V-E. And you're at DoveDocs.com, right? That's right, D-O-V-D-O-X. Where did that come from, by the way, that name? Well, uh, my, my wife is a physician, an MD, and I have a PhD, and so we were, I was setting up a website and uh, decided to get my own domain, and after tossing around ideas for a while, we came up with uh, you know the doctor's dove and variations on that, and then uh, actually, it was Lara who suggested using that spelling of it, uh, which I think is a really cool, condensed... Uh, but pronounceable spelling. Mm, it's good. Dove Docs, excellent. Dove Docs. Now we know the origin of Dove Docs. Great. And you can, of course, find out more about Twiv at twiv.tv. Please let us know what you uh, want us to talk about. Send us questions, comments, twiv at twiv.tv. You've been listening to This Week in Virology, the podcast about all things viruses. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week. See you next time. <laughs>